Welcome to Crime Most French, a weekly podcast taking you through intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Research and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open le vin and let the mayhem commence. The episode this week takes us to Paris in the post-Second World War era. And we are looking at a gang instead of a single person. Okay. It is the what's called as Le Gang des Tractions Avant, which is Front Wheel Drive Gang. They rob high profile places, they pocket a huge amount of money, they only work for about three years, and their particular particularity, which gave them the name later on, is they use Citroen front wheel drive cars, which were the first front wheel drive cars in the world. And that gave the name to the car, and therefore the name to the gang. I wonder if the uh, high-profile uh, gang that are still working in Europe uh, at the moment, uh, doing very high-profile robberies, I wonder if these are the inspiration. Could be. Could be. They're kind of working in a similar way, except 50 or 60 years apart. Mm-hmm. So to understand the gang, we need to go back in time a little bit. The gang was formed in 1945. The members of the gang varied from often conflicting backgrounds. So some of them came from the Gestapo in Paris, the French office of the Gestapo, okay. which was Rue Lauriston. Um, we heard of that because during the Landry affair, which is episode four or five, the, one of the inspectors on the case was a guy called Bonnie. Mm -hmm. And at the time already, he was known for being dodgy. And the lawyer for Landry tried to rule out a lot of evidence because it had been handled by Bonnie. But the judge at the time decided that, yes, he had handled them, but hadn't really taken part into the investigation. All he did is put signatures on things, so okay. it was acceptable, so they couldn't rule it out. Mm -hmm. But we heard that name before, and we mm -hmm. heard of the real Oriston before. So some of them came from the Gestapo office, some of them were gangsters, and some of them were resistance as well, which is slightly weird. Yeah, that's kind of like you're talking both uh, sides of the spectrum. Well, it's not even of a spectrum. You're talking two different sides of a coin, really, aren't you? Yes, yes. They came together through the Toulouse resistance network. Okay, so much further south then. Yes, yeah, south very far south yes. Mm -hmm. By 1944, the resistance network around Toulouse had been gravely damaged by the Germans because they mm. were desperately trying to keep control of the area. And at that point, it wasn't going well for the Germans. Um, in 44, we are the year the landing in Normandy happened, which was the 6th of June. Mm. The year um, most of uh, the west and south of France was freed as well. Paris was freed on the 24th of August. Toulouse around that time as well, sometime in August. So in 44, things started to change for the Germans, but they were desperately trying to keep control. Mm. And they were becoming harsher and harsher with anybody who they suspected had any kind of link with the resistance. So the networks were really, really damaged because of that. They were killing everybody, essentially. Okay, so there was no interrogations. It was just... Oh, there were. There was interrogations and torture, but they yeah. were doing it industrially at that point. Mm. So they were killing hundreds of people at once, and it was really yeah. an industrial operation at that point. We're not talking adhering to the Geneva Convention <laughs> at all. No, it didn't even exist. Didn't it? No, it didn't exist. No. But no, um, the Germans never did anything like that. So one of the leaders of the network, the resistance network around Toulouse, called Pierre Roux, was uh, an interesting guy. His aim in life during the war was to hunt down and kill all the high-profile collaborators. And by 1944, as far as he was concerned, there was only two people left around Toulouse. Okay. And he wanted to kill them. Right. But the problem was, to do that, he needed information. He needed to lay a trap or attack an area. And mm -hmm. on his own, it was impossible. He right. needed at least a way to escape. And the only guy he could trust at the time was known for being a very bad driver. Remember, in 1945, there probably wasn't even the driving license. No. So, or barely, it was like forward 10 meters or something. It was really ridiculous. So being bad at driving was very common because you didn't really learn. Yeah. So he has a big problem at that point. That friend 
decided to introduce him to somebody called Pierre Loutrel. Pierre Loutrel. He's the next member of the Rue Lauriston Gestapo in Paris, who in 1944 started to smell the change and decided that instead of waiting for the Germans to win, which was very, very unlikely, and by June he knew it wouldn't happen, he changed side. So basically it's that old adage of jumping horses uh, mid-race. Yeah, essentially, yes. Mm -hmm. So he decided, no, Germans are not going to do, so I'm now resistant. But the problem is you can't just do that because no, people really, will still no. remember you were on the <laughs> other side. No. But he's known for being a good driver. Oh, basically he's uh, Dustin Hoffman then, is he? Yeah, <laughs> except a real good driver. So th th that guy, Pierre Loutrel, mm -hmm. had a nickname already at the time, which was Pierre Le Fou, which is Crazy Pete. Yeah, if your nickname's crazy, it's never a good sign. Especially during the war. If you're yeah. crazy for people in the war, yeah. uh, you must be very crazy. There, there were some two films or more, I can't remember. At least two I can remember that have been done about him okay. in the 60s and 70s. So it wasn't a complete random event that he was in Toulouse at the right time. The reason for that is, even though he had been working with the Gestapo for most of the war, mm -hmm. he kind of became friend with a guy called Sikar. That was his, son, his, his surname. Okay. And he came from Toulouse. He was a resident from Toulouse. Right. Sicar befriended him because he wanted information. And Luttrell didn't see it. So he became friends with that guy. They were having drinks and stuff and they were talking. And he was giving away information that the Gestapo had. Mm. And he only realized that at the very, very end of their relationship. So by June 44, he decided that... He's done a lot for the resistance because he gave them lots of information, which saved lots of, pe lots of people, mm -hmm. and therefore they owe him one. So he would go to Toulouse and kind of claim his payback, essentially. Yeah. Which is very strange because he never gave information voluntarily, but no. he's going to pretend that he did. So it's all just uh, de terribly convenient for him at the time. Well, that's the only place he can go. Mm. He can't go anywhere else anyway. If he stays in Paris, he's dead. Mm. And... We will see later that a uh, number of people that were members of the Gestapo office, Rue Lauriston, managed to escape, mm -hmm. but very few, and at the very, very, very last minute, like we're talking days before it was, um, the war was taken over, over by the, the army, the French uh -huh. and American armies. So, so is, that when, is that when de Gaulle uh, marches well, into Well, that's when Paris. Leclerc arrived in the, the second DB, yes. Okay. And that was late August 40, uh, 44. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that is because the Gaulle didn't want a bloodbath in Paris because no. Paris had started to attack the Germans. Yeah. And he was worried that the Germans would fight back mm. and just kill everybody and destroy everything. Mm -hmm. The guy who in charge, the German in charge of Paris, had been asked to completely destroy Paris before he left and he refused. Mm -hmm. But he was worried that the Germans would just fight back. So he sent the closest um, French um, armored division that okay. he had, which was the Leclerc one, the second DB, to Paris like as Leclerc. fast as he could. Mm -hmm. So he bypassed the Germans, he bypassed the Americans, yeah. he bypassed everybody to be there as fast as he could. And yeah. he arrived on the 25th or 26th of August in Paris. But anyway. So, so, so what you have is, is crazy Pete uh, being pumped for information and then suddenly realizing he's being pumped for information and then decides to go with that and then decides to jump in bed yeah, well, well, with the resistance in yeah, Toulouse. When the Americans start to move a bit close, mm -hmm. he realizes that he had no yeah. choice. He's going to be, yes. he's going to be killed he's, because yeah, he's, he's either jumped Gestapo. or he's going to be pushed. Yeah. Exactly. So he mm -hmm. had to go somewhere and he remembered that guy mm -hmm. and he thought, okay, I'll give them information so they owe me something. Yeah. So I'll go there and mm. chance it essentially and that's what he did. So that's why he ended up in yeah. Toulouse. But I, but I like how the fact he, he's like, I gave them information. Well, you didn't yeah. really no, give them didn't. information. You were pumped for information. Yeah, yeah, no, no, he didn't do anything voluntarily. Yeah. He just gave them information because he was drunk. Yeah, but he, he thought he would use it to his advantage. Yes, yeah. yes that's what he did. And mm -hmm. that's how he contacted the, the network, the resistance network yeah. around Toulouse. He was saying, oh, I gave you lots of information via Sika. Yeah. I now want to be part of you. Yeah. And luckily enough, he was known for being a good driver. So mm -hmm. when Rue needed a good driver, he didn't really have the choice. So yeah. when he was introduced to him, he said, okay, you can come, I guess. So that's what they, de they did. Yeah. Crazy Pete seems to be quite wily. He may be crazy, but he seems to, to be able to read a situation quite well yes. and adapt to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm. definitely. 
and probably collect debts on the way. <laughs> yes. So for people who then become important and mm-hmm. useful. Yeah. So Roux and Loutrel decide to um, assassinate a guy called Cavalry, okay. who was one of the high-ranking Gestapo members in Toulouse. Mm-hmm. And it goes very well. They shoot him in a bar just opposite the German gendarmerie. Wow. So on the other side of the road. That's ballsy. Yeah. So Roux went in, looked around, saw the guy, shot him twice, and mm-hmm. get, got back into the car, and they were gone in like a minute. Mm-hmm. Nothing, ha- no, no, nothing could, be, could be done to stop it. Yeah. And then the other guy he had on his list was his right-hand guy. Okay. And they kill him w- within an hour. Wow. So he doesn't have time to, to escape. The, the grass certainly wasn't growing under their feet. Yes. But Wu was, even though his aim in life during the war was to kill collaborators, he hated to kill people. He didn't want to kill people. But as far as he was concerned, it was what he had to do. So he was a squeamish vigilant. He was totally squeamish. Mm-hmm. And for the second assassination where Luttrell was there, he saw that Wu was being all very nervous, very panicky, mm-hmm. um, sweaty, and he understood that he didn't want to do it. Okay. So he said, let me do it. I'll do it. I like to kill people. I'll do it. So who thinks for a while and decides, okay, I, if somebody can do it for me, I'm happy with it because I really don't want to do it. So Luttrell takes the gun, goes in, shoots the guy, goes back in the car and they go away. Mm. And he's all happy and he had a good, a good day. And who had his mission completed? So Crazy Pete living up to his name. Crazy Pete living up to his name, yes. And also Crazy Pete buying his way into the resistance. Yes. That's the way. Foot in the door. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And now he's part of it. So people remember that, yes, he was Gestapo, but also he was... But resistance. he's got rid of them. So, yes. Yeah. So after the war is finished, um, in, from September 45, 45? Yeah, from September 45 or so. Certainly in Europe it was... No, from January 45, sorry. Yeah, but certainly in Europe it was, the war was essentially over. Yes. Um, There's really no government at the time, so nobody's in charge, nobody's controlling anything. No. So order is maintained by what's called the FFE and NFTP. So FFE are French force from inside. Um, FTP are front tireur and partisan which is the communist version of it. So it's the far left groups. Okay. So FFE um, includes pretty much everybody except the far left. FTP includes only the far left. <laughs> right, okay. And they maintain order, but nobody controls them. So Luttrell exploits that by claiming to be FFE and being a lieutenant in the FFE, which is true. So th- there was kind of like governing going on, but there was no national network. Yeah, there was no, no national control. It was yeah. really all local and mm-hmm. left to whoever managed to take power, essentially, yeah. locally. So there was no, if you think of it, uh, there was no Holyrood, there was no Westminster, no. there no. was no there was none Washington. Yeah. No, there was no government. No. No. So essentially, it's this small group, the FFE and FTP, who mm-hmm. hunt down all the collaborators and who they think is collaborators. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, interrogating them and sometimes judging and killing them. Okay. Death penalty was very common at the time. I can't remember. Somebody said 100,000 people were killed that way or something. I mean, you have to consider, that, I mean, there's been six years of, you know, occupation. I mean, it must have been, very, well, five years of occupation, years, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it was, I mean, it was, uh, those must have been long, five uh, yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, de- definitely. And the Germans were not uh, no, they weren't known kind. for being very nice. There's no. not far from us, or also Glen, for example, one no. of the villages that were completely destroyed and everybody killed yeah. as they were going back. To Germany, it was yeah. the. Um, there's uh, th- there's no justification for, right for the actions yes. on either side, but you can understand yes. why there was a lot of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Violence. But there were people like Lutra who exploited it. Yes. By, kind of being part of the system, yeah. but then just doing what they want. So what yeah. they did was, he called collaborator anybody who had something he wanted. So it <laughs> could be jewelry, money, cars. Yeah. Whatever, You've got a nice guns. car. You you were him with the Nazis. Exactly, and yeah. accusing people of being collaborators and shooting them essentially, wow. and that was it. And at the time, of course, nobody would say anything because right. if you said something against somebody who was part of the FFE... Oh, so you you're a Nazi then. Yeah. Exactly, and mm. that was bad for you, so nobody said anything. So they did that for a while, and they accumulated weapons and money and cars and everything they would really mm-hmm. want. And they did that between roughly August 44 and January 45. Okay, so about a heavy four or five yeah. months of... 
by the start of 45, there's a start of a government and also there's the FFP starting to hear about what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So they decide to put an end to it and kick them out, which is not easy, but they managed to get rid of them. Mm. It's also where Loutrel met several of his old colleagues, some of the people who escaped from Paris, part of the Gestapo um, cell in Paris. They also all discovered the patriotic side, strangely. Yeah, weird that. Yes. And they mm-hmm. essentially form a gang. Yeah. And they become more and more gangsters and less and less law and order. Less until... and less vigilante, but more and more lining their pockets. Yes. Mm-hmm. Until they eventually get completely kicked out by the FFE who don't want to have anything to do with them and no. told them, if you stay here, you're dead. Mm. So at that point, they disappeared. And they disappeared by going to Paris. Okay. Because at that point, Paris was liberated and it was like the, the seizure of government. Yeah. So they start a gang there with the same members, a few others. The actual members of the gang are a bit fuzzy. There's historians agree on about five that everybody says, yes, they were definitely part of the gang. Mm-hmm. And then there's a number of them, like five, six of them, which is not clear whether they were part of the gang, exploited by the gang, just vaguely related by the, to the gang. It's not clear. But there's at least five clear members in that okay. gang. I guess there's no kind of like uh, organizational chart you can look up. No, for. exactly, yes. So some of these, for example, Joe Atia, which was Lutre's right hand, mm-hmm. is an ex-boxer who he met when he was a conscript in North Africa in 1938. Okay. They were part of what was called the Bagdaf, which was the Battalion of Africa. And it was essentially a prisoner, prisoner camp, except wow. for soldiers. So you had nowhere to go. Um, you were expected to kill whoever they were told to kill. And if you didn't, you would probably be killed by your colleagues anyway. So, so we're talking kind of like the same yeah, conditions and we're talking, as Guyana then. Yeah, we're talking also um, rapes happening in the showers and all that. It was essentially a prison. Yeah. And it was run as a prison, except the people who were in it were conscripts. They were not actually prisoners. No. But a lot of them were volunteers because mm. they realized that they were in trouble at some point. Mm. And the only way not to get to prison was to escape and volunteer for Badaf. God. But they essentially ended up in no worse prison. But I was anyway. just a way to say, I think I would rather have stayed in prison. I mean, because yeah. at least the environment in, in Yeah, uh, except that Europe's until 37, you could end up in Guyana, which probably was the one thing that was worse. Oh, well, that's true. So anyway, that, that's where he meets, for example, Aitya. So he's, like, he's kind of like the big muscle. He was a big dude. Yeah, he was a boxer. So mm-hmm. he was a very big dude. And... Some of the other members, we don't really know where they come from. Some we know are coming from the Gestapo office, but some of them mm-hmm. just happen to be gangsters that were around, really. Okay. Opportunistic uh, businessmen. Yeah. The first attack of the gang takes place on the, first, the 7th of February 1946 in Paris. So, I mean, they, they, they come to, to Paris, and they, they, I mean, it's only about a month and a half later, isn't it? No, they get to Paris in, sometime in forty five. Uh, late 45 maybe I can't remember exactly yeah. but yeah it's a little while after they arrived but yeah they, they were already formed in Toulouse anyway yeah, so that's, that's all they true. had to do is just do the same thing that's true they do a bit of sightseeing in January yeah. February they start yeah uh, exactly they start work yeah all they had to do really is start having information about what to attack and that yeah. was it where, where the rest the was money? same as they were doing in Toulouse so yeah, they're used to it mm-hmm. they didn't need to train or anything so on the 7th of February 1946, Loutre, Latia and two others from the Loriston office, mm-hmm. the Gestapo office, attack a bank lorry in the centre of Paris and they escape with uh, 3 million francs, which is about a quarter of a million euros today. Wow. So that's like $200,000. That's not a uh, chump change. Uh, no. Um, and it's a good first, first try. Yeah, not bad. It's not bad. It nobody's gives killed. Gives them a time for that. Yeah, nobody's killed, mm-hmm. which is good. Okay, that's almost good. And for the first time, they used their favorite escape vehicle, yeah. which is the front wheel drive Citroëns, mm-hmm. which at the time were fairly rare. Well, isn't that the start of NASCAR? Where all the moonshine Yes, it was, where the moonshine, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah, but they're very different cars, but yes. Yeah. But they were also probably the most powerful cars on the road as well, and that's yeah. why they chose those ones. Exactly. Um, in today's terms, the front wheel drives had two categories. They had the 11 and 15 Fiscal horsepower, which is a weird calculation on yeah. power and gearboxing ratio and whatever. Um, but that's 15 now is a category where Porsches start. All right, okay. So that gives you an idea of so what they were kind punchy, of car. punchy cars. They were punchy cars, yes. 
or poke, I think is the uh, the technical okay. term. It's the same thing gangsters did in the UK when they mm. were using Mark IIs. Yes, yes. It's the, giant, the same thing. Yeah. They were the most powerful cars around that they could get their yep. hands on, and that, that was it. That's what they were using. Exactly. So they used those cars, mm-hmm. and at the time, they weren't really called that because nobody was talking about it. Um, well, in early 45, 46, and 47, it was really the start of government, so mm-hmm. newspapers had more interesting and more... Yes. More things that really would interest the public yeah. to talk about, so they really didn't take about local crime. That at, the, at that time, it was just seen as, yeah, it's a small gang, they're doing small things, who cares? Mm. So nobody talks about it. The first articles I saw about it were like from sub-47. There no, was right, nothing okay. before that. Yeah. Nobody was interested in them mm-hmm. before that. So anyway, that's their first, and their first coup, and it worked okay. Mm. So three days later, they attack a post van wow. near Gare de Lyon, and they three get days. 8 million francs. That so that's it, a bit more. We're it, getting yeah. close to a million euros. I mean, that's, that's, not bad. that's quite good split between five people. Yes. And we don't know how, how it's split. Uh, it could be even or it could be uneven. Who knows? I have no idea. I, I I've never seen any mention of how the money was split. No, no. I wouldn't think Crazy Pete would be really into kind of like a fair share. Yeah, but at the same time, yeah, he likes money. But at the same time, he likes to kill most people as well. So he was getting something even if there was no money in, involved. But well, that's very true. Really and know. look at the pirates. They were yeah. very de- uh, democratic. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> So, so we just don't know, I guess. You can't we don't tell. know, yeah, I don't but know. But to me, Crazy Pete doesn't sound like he would give up a, an equal share. Probably not. Just after that, the gang splits up and Loutrel goes to Marseille mm-hmm. and the Mediterranean coast in general. Okay. There he meets with other old acquaintances from various places, most of them from gangs and uh, mafia and all that. Mm-hmm. And Atia stays in Paris with the rest of the gang. So Atia has to gang with him in Paris Loutrel goes down, makes another ga- a gang because he knows people, and they start attacking things and stealing money. Crazy Pete seems to be uh, have itchy feet. Yeah, it's, I guess so. But strange he doesn't stay in Paris. Yeah. Yeah, I su- th- there was no explanation for it, and it puzzled the police for a long time yeah. wh- what was going on. Mm-hmm. On the 14th of February, Loutrel attacks a money deposit place. Um, at the time, because the banks were a bit new, they were money places we talked about it in uh, another gang story in the previous episodes is that the guy that was walking around with all the jewels and the money yes yeah. that mm-hmm. was robbed in the street so same thing that you had people with no no protection or a bodyguard mm. and no more than that moving money between money places and money places not really via banks or anything like that yeah you didn't have the brinks vans or no they didn't have the first armored van was actually made at that time mm-hmm. roughly but most of the time it was just normal vans or yeah. even cars or people in the street walking <laughs> crazy so yes so they attack one of these money places and they take 2.5 million on the 14th of march they attack an edf that's the electric company still exists mm-hmm. van and they steal 1.2 million um, in the meantime atia who's still in paris how much did he get from edf 1.2 million it's a lot of money yeah it's uh for the lucky company yeah, but it's probably pay, employee pays. Oh, yeah, that's pays, true. People were paid in cash because mm. they yeah, didn't yeah. have bank accounts or anything. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so lots of cash was Good moving point. around at the time. Mm-hmm. So Adria attacks a man carrying money for the employees of a factory and he steals 7 million. On the 5th of April, Loutrel attacks a man transporting money again and doesn't go very well. He doesn't let his bag go. He tries to fight oh. back. The bag contains... Only 700,000 francs, so really not much. We're talking maybe 200,000 euros, so it's not a huge amount of money. Probably even less, actually, 150,000. I still really wouldn't sniff at it, but yeah. Yeah, yeah but for, for, for the risk taken, yeah. and it's not worth it. But anyway, um, he's shot because he didn't let the bag go. Mm. And the witnesses describe a guy who is totally drunk doing all the killing. Okay. At that point, the population is becoming a bit uneasy and outraged that this is happening in the streets of Marseille and nothing is happening. Marseille is quite a... Oh, there's a mafia in Marseille still. Oh, it's, yeah. it's a Mar- very... Marseille is edgy. It's a very edgy. It, and it yeah. still is. Yeah, it still is, yes. I yeah, mean, yeah. you have... Uh, because you've got the ports... Because it's a big, huge main port and mm-hmm. people coming from, uh, you know, all over the Mediterranean. It yeah. is... I've never been there. I've always been a bit scared. To yeah. The you know, press is, you have to be careful in Marseille. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but, be- but because people are getting pissed off and complaining, the mm. police is now starting to find those people. So mm. they do house-to-house searches and all that. They, 
It doesn't get anywhere, but at least no. they're starting to do something. No CCTV or... No. On the 20th of May, the gang attacks a bank in Aix-en-Provence, so they attack a proper bank this time. They and get very uh, little out of it. They get 45,000 francs. That's quite away from... Uh, Aix-en-Provence, yeah, yeah. Well, it's down the coast. It's yeah, not yeah. that far. It's probably about an hour and a bit from Marseille. I guess so. It's not very far. And they do it again a week later, because you never know, there might be more money the next time. They hit the same bank? Yeah. Oh, that's savage. On the 8th of June, after stealing a safe... They steal a safe? They steal a whole safe. They don't oh. have time to open it, so they just take it. I, I'm taking it's not one of these wee portable ones you, you have at home. No, that's something that's probably the size of a big <laughs> cupboard and weighs tons. So. Well, they're not using the Citroëns to uh, transport. No, for that they would have a van or a, a lorry. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah they're they organised. They, they know what they're doing. Logistically, how are you going to move it safe? But you would have to have a lorry, a number of people, and load it in the lorry and go away, essentially. It's doable. It depends on the size of the safe. Mm. If it's too heavy, you did a crane, but I don't know what the size was. They are nearly caught at that point. I'm not surprised. But they manage to escape by shooting at the gendarmerie and they injure one of the gendarmes, but it doesn't die. Mm, okay. On the 1st of July, tipped, up by a, tipped off by a post office employee, that's probably how they got a lot of their information, mm-hmm. Loutrel attacks the post office. And they leave with 33 million francs at that point. So we're talking several millions in today's money, two or three millions. I mean, if that was me, I would have been retiring to Guadeloupe and just not thinking about anything else. Yes, but when you're a gangster, you like the the gangster life and you like like to do things. True. You don't want to be living in a small hut. Yeah, there's a reason why most gangsters eventually get caught. It's just they can't stay put. They can't just disappear and live a very quiet life somewhere away from... uh, where they did their things, mm. they just they, they can't stay put. They have to do things, and that's how they get caught. Look at um, BTK. <laughs> oh yes, he had managed to escape being caught for like thirty or forty years. Yeah, and but he just couldn't leave it. He, he couldn't just leave it alone. He had yep. to do something. He had to boast about it and yep. send letters, and yep. and he got caught. And gangsters are gangsters and killers are really stupid most of the time. Yeah, but he was a dumbass boomer that didn't know technology. Yeah, but. Uh, if it hadn't been a floppy disk, it would have been something else because there was DNA on the stamp. There was lots of things. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, that's what gangsters do. Mm. So no, he, wouldn't, he would never have disappeared and spent the rest of his life, his life on the beach. That would never happen. So um, the idea to split up the gang came from Atia, who's often thought, even though he was a boxer, a boxer, he probably was the brain of the operation. He was the one planning and thinking and deciding what to do. Lutrel was just a meathead that was just doing it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess if you're big and you're tall, you're not going to have your head hit that much. So maybe it's <laughs> not that surprising he was the brains. Yeah, I guess so. So the idea was to confuse the police by attacking targets in Paris and in Marseille. Ah, because okay. then if it is the same method, the same MO, then the police would think it's the same people. Mm. And they would think that to do it, they would have to have their HQ somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. But So that- you'd be talking somewhere around about our area then? No, uh, no, that would be in the east, so it would be north of Lyon somewhere, um, in Burgundy probably, okay, something yeah. like that. And it worked, because that's exactly what the police thought. They thought that they had to be somewhere in the middle, so mm-hmm. they started searching in the middle. There was only one cop that figured it out, because he was looking at the police reports, and he realized that the, all the attacks in Paris had no death. Nobody was ever killed, mm-hmm. very rarely injured. Whereas in Marseille, it was always a bloodbath. And they thought, that can't be the same people. Like, every single time there's an attack in Marseille, somebody dies. Mm. Every, every time there's an attack in Paris, nobody dies. Good old crazy Pete. He's very predictable. Exactly. So he figured out that it had to be two gangs. Yeah. Even though they were using the same MO, roughly. Mm. But he was ignored by this, this hierarchy, so nothing happened. They didn't, just didn't want of to know about not. it. But he was right. If he, if yeah. he had been listened to, they might have caught them, but they searched in the wrong yeah. place for a long time. So one gang, two branches. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. But nobody thought that. Yeah. They, they thought it was the one gang and they were traveling yeah. from Paris to Marseille all the time. After a few days rest, the gang is woken up by a police operation on the 14th of July. We're talking Marseille again. Uh, they were staying in the hotel and the police probably was tipped off. So they... Came to the hotel and started searching it. 14th of July, I guess they thought uh, they'd be safe. Must Possibly. Be, must have been quite busy. Yeah, it's assumed that it's the Marseille Mafia that tipped up the police. 
Mm. But it's not sure because, of course, there's no record left no. of that time, so we can't know. But the general idea is that the the mafia is getting really pissed off at Lutra Island, want to get rid of him. And yeah, I mean, it's it's high profile. It's a lot of money. That's yes. a lot of policemen wanting to stop it. So. Exactly. So there's a shootout, of course, because they're yeah, going to try to escape. Mm-hmm. One of the gang members is arrested, one is wounded, and two policemen are wounded as well. Indeed. Lutrel k- takes the wounded member, Roar, uh-huh. who is one of the satellite members, he's not one of the core five, okay. to a doctor to help him. Uh, however, he's Roar, arrested on the 20th of July anyway. Okay. He's sentenced in 1949 for the robberies and the murder that happened in one of the robberies to life of hard labor. Uh-huh. He's lucky there's no Guyana prison anymore. Oh, I know, I know, that's closed, isn't it? Lutrel and an accomplice hide in Marseille. And one day, going to buy cigarettes, he's arrested because he looked a bit dodgy. (laughs) And he's sent to the local jail. But before they can identify and process him, he escapes. Ah. He steals one of the guns of the cops in the police station in jail. And he escapes. And at that point, nobody knows that they actually had Lutrel in their hands. Mm. If they had known, he would not have escaped. (laughs) But they didn't know. They didn't have time to identify who he was. Mm -hmm. So at that point, Lutrel decides that Marseille is not that welcoming. So he goes back to Paris. Okay. He feels the heat, so he goes north. Yes, exactly. In Paris, he lives a high life. He showers people with money. He was known to give tips in the thousands of francs. He drives flash cars. He either steals or buys them. So he keeps a nice low profile. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Yeah, Mm -hmm. very low profile. He's seen with good-looking women. Um, Before he went to Marseille, his girlfriend was an expertise prostitute who was known to be a bit (laughs) rough-looking. And she's out of the picture at that point. She's oh. replaced by somebody looking a lot better. And probably he, safer for her, I would think. That's probably why she survived, Yeah, I suspect, yes. And she is known for drinking a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, one day I read a story where there was a guy who had met him in the African battalion okay. and came to him and said he needed money. And Lutrell didn't recognize him and the guy told him a few stories and then he suddenly remembered him and he gave him, gave him a massive... Um, pile of of um, banknotes, money, right. and told him, "Okay, that's that's here for you. Don't come back." <laughs> <laughs> but he was doing that fairly regularly. So, yeah, so if buying, you could buying. prove that he knew you or you ha- had at po- some point in the past being his friend, he would give He'd you be generous lots of you. money. Yes, it's easy to be generous when it's not your money. Of course, of course. So he was drinking a lot, and mm. his girlfriend, who's interrogated at some point in the future, uh, says that his breakfast. Most of the time was two large pieces of toast soaked in Armagnac Cointreau or pure pastis and a bowl of champagne. Well, in the words of Kurt Vonnegut, breakfast of champions. That's the breakfast of cham- champions, yes. I'm very surprised his, uh, his name wasn't Alky Pete rather than Crazy <laughs> Pete. <laughs> yes, it should have been Alky Pete, yes. But no, it was Crazy Pete. So the gang goes back to business. Everybody's back in Paris. Okay. So on the we'll 16th of July, between the 16th of July and September, they commit five robberies. They attack a bank van on the 16th of July. They take 3.2 million. Mm-hmm. They attack an SNCF, that's the um, train company. Ba, ba, a ba, depot. Ba, ba. In, on the 29th of July, they take 9 million. Again, <laughs> that's what was probably employee pay. Mm. On the 1st of August, they try to steal 500 kilos of gold. Uh, 500 that, kilos. 500 kilos. So for that, they had all planned everything and they had a, a lorry with them to load all the gold and everything. And it's not clear what happened because, of course, there's no witnesses. Um, but it somehow went wrong. Okay. And they ended up having to escape at the last minute and they just took nothing out of that operation. It could be that somebody tipped off the police or something. We, we don't know. But that, that operation failed. So they, so they needed to have watched Die Hard of the Vengeance. For the logistics. Yeah, but that failed as well. No, it didn't. They almost got away with it if it almost. hadn't been for John McLean. Well, that was the same <laughs> for them. They almost got away with it. Yeah. It's just that at some point it started to go wrong. And I can't remember what it is. Uh, there's a few theories about it. I, mm. I can't remember if it's the police that turned up or the, somebody yeah. gave away the what was happening. I can't remember. But anyway, it failed. Yeah, so but, didn't but get that money. presumably once they had done the, uh, they had moved that safe down in Provence, they obviously had the confidence to think they could move something heavier yes, than just paper money. So. Yes, 
On the 24th of August, they attack a post office van and they take 8 millions. Mm -hmm. On the 31st of August, they attack a bank and they take 2 millions. And finally, in September, they do it again and they get, get 2 millions. So they're getting probably over 50, 60 million at that point. That's crazy. Yeah. At that point, the police knows the gang. You know, they know who's in the, who's in the gang yeah. and they know that Loutrell is the leader. Um, mainly because people eventually recognize him. Because he, he, he's not discreet, uh, as no. we saw earlier. Yes. Um, he doesn't lay low. No. So the same people see him at mm. a bar, for example, and later on attacking a van in the street or something. Yeah. So people are starting to say, okay, yeah, I know who that is. That's that guy. Well, presumably all the criminals uh, know who he is anyway. And the police yeah, totally. always have good CIs. So yeah, yeah, of course. He, he, yes, and at, at that point, most of the police and government had links to the, yeah. to the gangs and yeah. to various dodgy mm -hmm. things during the war. So, yeah, definitely, there's still mm. a lot of contacts between the police and uh, the mafia, for example. But you have to admire the fact that they work very, very fast. Huge, yes. huge amounts of money, very, very quickly. Yes. If only they had a good exit strategy, they, they probably would But they had a good exit strategy, and it was the cars. And it well, worked every yes. single time. They were never caught because of the cars. They were always either yeah, that, in the cars, and they would escape. That's, that's sort of like leaving from the, yes. uh, the, the, the scene of the crime. Yes. I'm talking about an actual exit strategy from their... Oh, from the business? Yeah, from the Oh, but none business. of them wants to leave the business. It uh, makes no, them I mean, too much money. Th that's where they went wrong. Oh, yeah, totally. Yes, you have to know when to stop. But yeah. most gangsters don't. No. They just want more. No, as, uh, as we already discussed. Yeah. So at, at, at that point, they know who the leader is. They mm -hmm. knew who the members are. Yeah. And also, the police find very strange that they're always super well informed. So they know exactly when to strike and how and how to get out very fast. Mm. So they're starting to think that there might be links between them and various places, yeah. banks and whatever. Lots of leaks. Yeah. But that really pisses off the interior minister who doesn't want to have a scandal where the police, for example, is shown to be linked to gangs mm. because he himself is linked to gangs and yeah. doesn't want it to be oh, known. Dear. So he doesn't want any noise in that direction yeah. around him. So he charges the police to find them and mm. tell them to use whatever means are necessary. Yep. And it was understood at the time that it was really needed to be killed. Wanted dead or alive, preferably Mo mostly dead. dead. Mm -hmm. yeah. At that point, the police starts working properly, mm -hmm. actually trying to catch them okay. instead of just vaguely guessing, oh Making yeah, oh, it's them, okay, yeah, off, yeah. off they're gone already. Mm -hmm. Now they're trying to catch them. So in September, they receive a tip-off, the... Gangs spend a lot of time at an inn in Champigny-sur-Marne, so it's south of Paris, okay. in the suburbs. They set up a surveillance operation for a while to know who's who, who goes where, when, okay. and what, which bars are really the ones where the gangs go. Mm. Because at the time, remember, it's the 50s, so there's a bar at every street corner. Of course, yeah. So they need to know where they go exactly so they can do something about it. At some point during the surveillance, a car is spotted on the side of the road. And three people were in it. They looked very drunk or asleep, <laughs> probably because they were drunk in the first place. So the cops go and investigate, and one of the cops goes to the car, and he spots that the red plate of the car is a CD plate. CD are the two letters C and D, which on French plates means corps diplomatique, which means uh. it's a embassy car. Oh, you know I'm going to do it. Diplomatic immunity. Exactly. And for that reason, normally CD plates don't get fined, don't get no. stopped. Whatever. They can do, they can what do they anything want. they want. Yeah. yeah. Plow people down. Yes, exactly. Go through red lights. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. As we know, it happens, especially in the US. Mm. So he still is a bit surprised that there's a, a diplomatic car in the middle yeah. of the suburbs of Paris with three drunk or <laughs> asleep people in it. Yeah. So he goes and has a look. He checks with his um, police station what the car registration is mm -hmm. assigned to, and he's told that it is a Delay, which was the luxury cars at the time. Now it would be a Rolls Royce or a Bentley. Oh, right, okay. And it belongs to the Swedish ambassador, and it hasn't been reported stolen. <laughs> okay. So presumably that's the Spanish ambassador. So the guy goes and... The Swedish, uh, Swedish ambassador, I think you said Spanish. Did I say Spanish? Or you Swedish? said Spanish the second time. No, it's the Swedish ambassador. So the cop goes and checks, he talks to the people there, he talks especially to one of the guys who's still awake, mm -hmm. and he doesn't know, but it's Loutrel. He's all drunk and disraveled and surrounded by bad-looking guys. So okay. you, 
if you saw them walk in the street, you would know they're gangsters, but strangely in a, in a diplomatic car. Yeah, probably um, not who the ambassador yeah. would be hanging about. His... Uh, his uh, detail, his, yes, uh, exactly. It could be security or detail something. are much better yes. looking than. So, uh, so he he talks to the guy for a little while. They even talk about fishing because the cop was into fishing, and okay. they have a pleasant discussion. But he doesn't push <laughs> his luck because it's a diplomatic car. He goes away. Mm-hmm. What he doesn't know is that Lutran had bought the car from the Swedish ambassador, mm-hmm. totally legally, but forgot between the Abonis mm. to register to his name. So officially, it's still registered to the, the Swedish ambassador. Ah. He never changed the plates. So didn't that's really how he ended up having a, a diplomatic car. Yeah, but he probably didn't really legitimately buy it. I'm presuming he no, bought no, it. No, he did. He did. Yeah, indeed, but he bought yeah. it with hot bought money, it. though. It well, wasn't yeah, really well, technically yeah, of his. Course, he had no money of his own. It doesn't work. Mm. So yeah, of course, it was stolen money, but he did buy it. Mm. So as far as the, the Swedish ambassador was concerned, concerned yeah, yeah. he had sold a car from the embassy to a guy yeah. with money and there was nothing wrong there. But he didn't know the money was hot. It, of course not. How, do we, how would you know? No, that's true. At the time, people were paying with cash, so exactly. it was normal. No. But having a diplomatic car was very useful because you tend to be left alone. Mm, yes. On the 25th of September, they hear that the gang is in one of the inns mm-hmm. um, in Champigny. And they send 350 policemen. 350. 350. For five people. But they don't know how many, really. Because remember, nobody really knows who's in the gang. They know a few of them, probably the main five. Yeah. But who knows who else in that inn is part of the gang. So they, they don't know how many people are really who they want. Still. 350? But 350 is a bit over the top, yes. <laughs> it's way over the top. I mean, that's... That's a uh, riot cr- uh, crowd control numbers. That's ridiculous. Yes. However, when they go in, they find no gang member. Ah. But they hear that there's three members of the gang that are in an inn just down the road. Okay. One of them is at here. So they move all their hardware mm-hmm. to that other place and they start again. So they quietly and discreetly move 350 people. Yes, they surround the, the bar and everything, mm-hmm. and they call for reinforcements. And What? No, no. And they call for reinforcements? Yeah, so yeah, 350, 350 might not enough. cover it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God. They even have uh, armoured uh, vehicles and stuff. They essentially <laughs> brought tanks and uh, machine guns and everything. They're, they're really preparing for a siege. Oh, they're going over the top a bit, aren't they? A little bit, yes. So Atia and a few of the gangs are inside, but Lutrel isn't. Lutrel is drinking at another inn. So the siege starts and is run by somebody called Casanova, an inspector. He was ah. very famous at the time in Paris. He was a good cop. But not that Casanova. <laughs> not, no. Not no, the Italian another Casanova. Another one. And it doesn't go to plan because at some point one of the gangsters goes out of the, the bar and start peeing on the side of the, the car, the house. And one of the cops shoots him. And later he explains that he thought he had a gun. He didn't have a gun, but anyway, he shoots him. So wow. At that point, everybody hears it <laughs> and everybody knows in the bar that That's okay, it, the piece is something shattered. is going on outside. Yeah. So after that, there's a shootout. Mm. Um, they, they shoot everything they can, but they don't hit anybody. So everything's peppered. Essentially, yeah, there's wall, holes everywhere. The, unfortunately, at that point, the advantage of surprise is gone, and, and they mm, were yeah. counting on it, so mm. they could arrest people instead of having to shoot them. So that was the equivalent of when you're walking in the woods to snap, uh, stand on a dry twig and snap. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly, a very loud snap. The owner of the bar, who had nothing to do with the gang, wants to surrender. He wants to say, okay, it's not me, I'm, I'm nothing to do with those people. Mm-hmm. So he goes to the first floor, which has a bedroom that goes on, has a window on the road. Okay. And at that point, they had it was night, and the police had all these, you know, the big war projectors. Oh, um, the searchlight thing. Yeah, searchlight. Yeah. So mm-hmm. they had that. They had several of those. Okay. So it was pure daylight around the around the bar. So yeah. he opens the window with his hands up to negotiate, and just he wants out, and he's shot before he has time to say anything. Yeah, that was a bit of a foolish move. At that point, Casanova is starting to think that something is going on. There's, there was no reason to shoot that guy. It's two guys who are now shot by his own cops for yeah. no reason whatsoever. Mm. So he's starting to wonder if his cops have been briefed to mm. kill everybody so that there's no question asked. Yeah. Because some people don't want questions to be asked. Nope. 
So he's starting to have doubts and he goes to complain to the prefet who has at that point arrived. Okay. And he brought with him um, the US Army, not for the siege, but just to show them how things are done. <laughs> and he will regret that. Oh, no, that's not how it's done at all. <laughs> nope. So he complains to the prefet and the prefet says, no, no, there's nothing wrong. Just go and get them. So, just carry on killing people. Yeah. And Casanova understands that the, the policy is they want everybody dead. And that's probably what happened. Mm. So Luttrell, who's in the bar nearby, hears by the bar owner where he is that mm -hmm. something is going on. Yes. Um, there seems to be a network of uh, information between the bar owners at the time. Yeah. So one bar owner calls another one who calls mm. another one, and that spreads. Yeah. So at that point, he's been drinking pastis after pastis, so he is probably well drunk. Gross. He jumped into his car. He forces his way through the roadblocks. He shoots at the cops with his machine gun. <laughs> he goes into the bar. The cops don't have time to react because they're just... They don't understand how a guy with a car is shooting at them for some yeah. reason. He goes into the bar, gets the other three, and escapes with, with the car. That's just insane. And the cops so, only shoot at him when they start to escape. I mean, he had the opportunity just to leave quietly. And yeah, but that's not what, what he no, does. No, that's obviously not... No. Good old crazy Pete to, to the no, rescue. Pete and Atia had a special relationship because they had been to the, the African yeah, battalion. Of course. And Atia was often, often talking about Luttrell as being his brother. Yeah. And Luttrell was probably considering the same thing. So he yeah, considered well, Atia as his brother. So he just went and got so, him. So crazy Pete swoops in, saves the day, yes. and then they, yeah. they, they scarper. And they escape. The car is found later full of holes and flat mm. tires and everything, but nobody's killed. There's still a number of cars to escape, and the police completely lose his strike. The reason why they didn't go after him is because all the 350 cops came with cars. They had tanks, they had buses, they had lots of things, <laughs> and the street was essentially completely blocked. They couldn't even get out themselves. That's just nuts. They were blocking each other, uh. trying to get out. And that's how they escaped. It's now just turning into the end of the Blues Brothers. Oh, it's That's just turning ridiculous. into a farce at that point, yes. Total farce. Yeah. So they escape. On the 30th of September, one of the gang members is arrested in Montmartre mm -hmm. after having called a garage for an unrelated reason okay. that happened to be bugged by the police for another case. Handy. Yeah. So he's arrested, and I can't remember which one it is. It's one of the minor members of the gang, and okay. he dies of TB in prison in 1953. Oh, nasty. In October, Luttrell and a few members of the gang attack a wine seller, a guy who sell wines, sells wine. Okay, rather than just a, a cat. Not a seller, a, yeah. Yeah, a guy who sells. Um, and they take the money. Mm -hmm. They are nearly arrested escaping because there was a trap laid by the police for another gang that they were expecting in the area as well. So that's the second time they're nearly trapped because of some other gang and another operation. Yeah. Was post-war Paris just like a wash with lots of gangs? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was lots of... There was very little um, police presence and yeah. the police was kind of complicit anyway. Mm. So, it, it, yeah, it was a lot of gangs That's and nuts. lots of uh, low-level um, mm. crime in Paris at the time. Yeah. Oh, you certainly couldn't call them low-level. Well, uh, when you start killing people, no. 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 So in November, they attack a, a bank in Versailles, mm -hmm. it fails because the car broke down. That's the first time the cars let him down. Oh, no. On the 5th of November, Luttrell, drunk, robs a jewelry shop. <laughs> the owner defends himself, and it's not too clear at the time, but Luttrell ends up with a bullet in, uh, in the abdomen and gets shot. Ah. But the jeweler's life, wife maintains that he, her husband never shot anybody. Okay. So nobody knows exactly what happened. The car is found later, uh, covered in blood inside. So they yeah, know somebody's been shot. Yeah, I mean, that's a stomach shot. wound's pretty nasty. Yeah. The I now have an image of uh, Pulp Fiction, Mr. Orange. Yeah, well, it's exactly Mr. that. Mr. Orange yes. in the back of the seat. Yeah. And, and it was a jewellery store yes. that they did hold up. So but maybe Tarantino got the inspiration for that story. From could that story. Be. I don't know. Could be. But that's exactly what happened. Mm. Um, Atia and another accomplice take Luttrell to a doctor they know, mm -hmm. get him patched. The doctor says that there's not something he can do. He doesn't have the, the tools no. or the, the rooms or anything to operate on him. So the only way they're going to, to save him is to take him to hospital. He would need a transfusion anyway, presumably. Most right? likely, yes, I would think so. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. If the inside of the car is covered in blood, he must yes. have lost quite a lot. So they take him to hospital and register him under a fake name. Mr. Orange. Mr. Orange, yes. <laughs> I don't know what the name was. I didn't see it. No. The, the hospital operates and the doctor are fairly confident that he's going to survive. Mm -hmm. But he needs to stay in the hospital for several months because he did a lot of damage. He had a um, bowel that was... Uh, through and through with a bullet, um, his intestines were clipped as well. So there was there a was a mess trauma. in there. A lot of trauma. Yeah. Mm. A few days later, Atya and a couple of the gang go into a hospital dressed as nurses and doctors. Okay. So they had white coats. Right. And they say that they come to take the the guy in room nineteen to take him to another place. And they were acting all confident and calm and everything, and they feel paperwork, and as normally would have happened with a transfer from a hospital. Yes, so I, nobody at the hospital asked questions. I, I always think that's very much a bit... I haven't spent a lot of time in hospital myself, but I always think that's very much a kind of like a thing of the, in the movies that, you know, you're always transferred to another hospital. I don't know. I guess it happens, but... But it must know. happen because nobody, nobody asked questions. They were fine with it, so mm -hmm. they came with a stretcher, they put him on the stretcher and right. went away with the ambulance. On the way to the hiding place, to the house they were going to take him, the ride is a bit rough because the roads are not that good at the time. And every well, time, no, I mean, you're talking about a city that's gone through a lot of war. Yeah. So every time they were going over a bump or a pothole or something, they could hear Lutrell make noises, yeah. uh, which probably was him suffering because of the... Yeah. That's also the, the what, transport pre-student uh, riots as well. So there'll be a lot of cobbles. It'll be cobble streets, yes, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 At some point, the Atya and the driver, and I don't remember who that is, had an argument about whether to go slower or not, so that the drive would be a bit more yeah. smooth. But the driver disagrees with Atya because they have the siren and the lights on and everything, and they're going fast in the streets yeah. of Paris. And he says, if we go slow, we're going to be stopped That's, by the cops. Yeah, it's going to be Because an ambulance with all these lights mm. doesn't go slow. It's yeah. that normal. Fair so enough. they continue going fast. Eventually, they get to the house where they wanted to take him. Mm -hmm. But he won't survive. He dies a couple of days later. Oh, come on. I'm denied my shootout, my uh, Butch and Sundance shootout yeah. in the, with the Bolivian uh, army. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, most likely the transport is what killed him. If uh, he had been left in the hospital, he probably would have survived. Well, I would have thought so. I mean, if you're going to die, yeah. you, you die reasonably quickly from bullet wounds. But yeah, yeah, I mean, these things all need to be. So they decide to bury him on a small island mm. on the Seine. And the Seine, the river, has lots of small islands. So they just took, he took him to one of those and they bury him. And he won't be fine, found for three years. Okay. The doctors examining him later, when they eventually find the body, mm -hmm. said that the bullet was shot from above, right. which is not consistent with the shootout. No. So the jeweler's wife is right. Yeah. Her husband never shot him. It takes a long time to get down to what actually happened. Mm -hmm. And it's only years later that the police manages to kind of put pieces together to, for a story that kind of makes sense. But of course, it's all testimonies from gangsters, so who knows what's true. Yeah. But they, they, they get the story out of all the interrogations eventually. What they say was the, the day of the robbery, Lutre was apparently even more drunk than normal. And the robbery didn't go right because the, the jeweler defended himself. Mm. And he eventually died as well because he tried to run after the car and was hit by another car on the road. <laughs> oh, no. So the jeweler died. But anyway, um, so it didn't go well. So I, uh, Lutre was kind of nervous and playing with his gun and stuff. <sighs> and Atia, who was sitting at the front, Lutre was sitting on the back seat, at some point told him to stop playing with the gun because he didn't want to get shot because it was all loaded and cocked and ready to uh -huh. shoot. So Lutrell put the gun into his pants, as gang gangsters do. Yeah. And on the way out, his hand caught his belt and somehow made him pull the trigger. Uh -huh. And he shot himself that way. And so we're talking Pulp Fiction. We're talking Pulp Fiction. And also the trajectory of the bullet makes sense because it came from above. Mm. So, so basically they need to drive to find Mr. Wolf to clean up the car. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that, that's, that's what probably happened. Yeah. Years later, um, we're talking early 50s, the, the police find who the doctor was mm -hmm. and they interrogate him and he says that, yes, they buried the body on a small island, so he takes them there. Okay. And uh, at first, 
they dig where he says they buried the body, but they can't find anything. And at some point when they are ready to go and give up, one of the cops pulls on a, a rubber pipe or a rubber hose and a finger comes with it. So Ooh. they dig more and they find the skeleton. And that skeleton was below, uh, under um, a whipping willow, as mm. the doctor said, but not the one he said. He got the tree wrong. So uh. it was, he had the re- right kind of tree on the right island, but not the right tree. It oh. was about 50 meters away. Once you've seen one weeping willow there. Yeah, it was years seen. earlier. So <laughs> you can, it was obviously a bit confused yeah. by where, where it was. So they dig at the skeleton and they find that the skeleton had rubber hoses coming out of it. Okay. And that's because of the damage he had done with the bullet. Ah, yes. Uh-huh. He couldn't have normal um, no. bowel movements and anything. So it was all done by pipes. Mm. And so these pipes are the pipes that then. the hospital had put inside him. Yeah. So that's how they know it's right. him. Right. Okay. So they did find him. He died. And it was a story Mystery for all the time. Mystery solved. Mystery solved. In the meantime, when he disappeared, after the jury heist that went wrong, mm-hmm. a second Crazy Pete appears, Crazy Pete number two, and that's how he's recorded in the police reports. Pierre Fou Douzième. It, it, it's Pierre Le Fou number two. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He, he, he is actually called Crazy Pete as well. <laughs> it just happens to be that. Crazy Pete's obviously kind of like the John Smith of... Um, <laughs> of the gangsters, yeah, gangsters. probably, yes. He's very different from Luttrell. Luttrell was small and scrawny and okay. actually crazy. Right, yeah. Whereas yeah. Crazy, crazy Pete number two was tall, athletic. Uh, he looked like a boxer mm-hmm. and he normally didn't shoot people. So he wasn't crazy. But so he was, he's in fact more rational, Pete. He was way more rational and he was using Crazy Pete as a cover, mm-hmm. essentially because people talking about him to the cops were talking about Crazy Pete and the cops assumed it was, it was that, Crazy Pete. that Crazy Pete. Because at that time he had disappeared mm-hmm. and nobody knew where he was. There were rumors yeah, he was uh, on the island going dead, around. Yes. Yeah, well, yes, he's on the island. Mm-hmm. But people were saying that he's either hiding in Paris mm-hmm. or some were saying that he's gone to South America and robbing banks in South America with his Nazi friends. Yeah. So nobody really knew anything about him. So it wasn't improbable that it was him doing attacks on mm, whatever exactly. i mean look look how many different places hoff is supposed to be buried in for goodness sake yeah mm. so so the police actually thinks it's him for a long time mm-hmm. and that's how crazy pit number two gets away with things yeah. because they're not looking for him they don't no. know they barely know about him they've heard of him but that's about it he's small the, time yes crazy he's much pit. lower yeah. uh, than crazy pit number one yeah but he uses that to as a means to not being investigated but eventually he's caught he does a few good robberies in this mm-hmm. time but he gets caught he escapes many times as well, because he was good at escaping. Okay. And once he escaped with a cardboard gun covered in shoe polish, and that worked. He just left the prison that way. Oh, that's insane. Imagine that, ma- managed to kind of like make a prop out of a, a bit a cardboard. of cardboard. Yeah. That guy needs to be working in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, he managed to make it look like a 9 millimeter parabellum, as far as wow. I remember in the story. So, so anyway, he does that for a while, and mm-hmm. it disappears eventually as well. So, Lutra is dead. Right. Several of the gang have been arrested. Mm-hmm. Some of them are in prison. Some of them are in prison and will die of TB or whatever. Yeah. So the gang is now pretty small. So Atia, the right yes. hand, mm-hmm. um, he's arrested in 1947 in Marseille for a robbery from 1946. Oh, okay. He's only sentenced at the end of 53 because it takes a long time. Oh, wow. That's a long, yeah. long time. And he's out on the same day. So he doesn't even spend time in prison. Oh, so, I mean, when he was arrested, he was kept in prison that whole time? So yes. Was, it was time and served. And as soon as he's sentenced, he's out. Yeah, so he's time served. But, man, that's still... It wasn't... Well, it, it's not clear what it was. The, um, one of the things was that he was in a German camp during the war in Mauthausen. And many people in charge at the time, and many famous people, had been prisoners there as well. Okay. And they testified to his good nature and good behavior in the camp, uh-huh. and it's assumed that that's why he wasn't sentenced to anything. He oh, he's a good go. dude. He's, he's a, a good, good dude. dude. Yeah, it's not his fault. It's not him. It's he's only okay. a bit robbing round the edges. Yeah. So he kind of tries to go straight after that. He buys a bar, okay. uh, which he renames the Gavroche, which becomes fairly famous because lots of uh, writers and stuff spend time at that, right, okay. that bar at some point. So he kind of does that. He does a few robberies, very low in the background for not much money, but only for good 
good old times when some just old, to keep his arm in yes yeah, when old good go, gang members come and say oh i have a thing can you help yeah. us he said oh, okay so he does it with them but that's about it doesn't do anything, anything more but his than heart's that. obviously not in it yes he he works as well for the secret services and the secret services at the time it appears from what i've read was hiring a lot of gangsters for operations that were under the table. Oh, right, with the black ops. Black ops. And Atia goes to Morocco a few times um, for unknown operations mm. uh, against Morocco. One of them was um, the assassination of a very famous um, independentist in Morocco. Okay. What was his name? Ben Barka. Ben Barka, I think, possibly. Um but he fails okay. on that one. Menbaka is eventually assassinated, but it wasn't by Atia. It was another way. I think Morocco's still kind of like part of the French family at that time, is it? Yes, Morocco got independence in 54. Okay. But Morocco was a bit strange. Morocco wasn't really uh, a colony. It was a protectorate. Mm, right, okay. A bit like um, Indochina was. So Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia were mm-hmm. also a protectorate. They weren't actual colonies, so they were yeah. semi-independent. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why, for example, the relationship between France and Algeria and France and Morocco are very, very different. Yeah, yeah. France and Morocco get along fine. Yes. There's no problem. Mm. Although at the moment it's not going very well, but for other reasons. Um, but until now, mm. the relationships were, were good. So you could go on holiday to Morocco and they were all welcoming and they had no problems against the French. In Algeria, it's a very different story <laughs> oh, because God, no. the war the, of independence yeah, was very yeah. bloody. That's nasty. So, nasty. But France wanted to keep Algeria part of France. Mm. And it was, at the time, not a colony either. Algeria was a department. In fact, two or two departments. It was an actual part of France, oh, like right, Martinique okay. or Guadeloupe are today. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. So they were part of the country. They weren't colonies. But mm. the Algerians wanted independence, and that, was, that went really bad. Mm-hmm. So that's why the relationship is very different. But there were some activities in Morocco for independence at the time. And mm. Needed the secret to be, services wanted to get yeah, rid of well, that. Yeah, needed it to be squashed. And he, at some point, came back from that failed operation. I think it was Ben Barker, but anyway. Um, and on the plane, uh, the plane stopped in, in Spain. Right. And he realized that the Spanish cops were searching everybody and integrate, interrogating everybody. And at the time, he had a gun, two grenades, and ammunition on himself. <laughs> Because he came from an assassination, so mm. he was loaded with whatever he would have ne- needed. Yeah. And that's, that's definitely the days before you have to take your shoes off to go definitely. through the, uh, security. Yes. So he manages to get rid of the, gu- the gun and the, the grenades in the toilets, mm-hmm. and he thinks, oh, I'm good. Yeah. And then just when the police got to him, he realized he still had the bullets in his pocket. He had six bullets in his pocket. Whoops. So he's arrested. And when he's taken off the plane, he sees that the person in charge of the airport is one of his old acquaintances from before, before the war. Okay. So he goes and signs him and goes and see, sees him. And he shakes his hand with the bullets in it, the six bullets in it, thinking that the guy would keep the bullets so that he's not found with yeah. those. And the guy just opens his hand and all six bullets fall on the floor. And clink, 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 clink. And he's... At that point, sent to jail. I can see that happening in slow motion. Just yes. them raining down slowly. Spain at the time had a terrorism problem. Yeah. And they really wanted to catch all terrorists yeah. on their territory. So that would have been bad for Atia. He is extradited to France. Uh-huh. And the way he does that is to plead guilty to an assassination in France. Because then the French government requested him to be sent to France for yeah. trial. I mean, I think I would have rather spent time in... in in France, because I mean, but that was also Franco, his idea. Franco so, was uh, that yes. wouldn't that's not a good government. No, so the Spanish sent him to him to France, yeah. and he's then tried in France, and he <laughs> said, oh, "No, I didn't do any of that. I just he just said that, that just... because I didn't want to be in jail in Spain, <laughs> yes. and he gets away with it." Wow. Okay. So he's let go Bit because bold. he actually had nothing to do. He had a good alibi for the for the the case he pleaded guilty for. Oh, that's they handy. actually check, and he wasn't there. He couldn't possibly have done it. That couldn't have been involved. Handy. Very so handy. they let him go because what good, else could st- do? good strategy though. That was a good <laughs> strategy, but he couldn't go back to Spain, obviously. Yeah. So eventually, um, he does a few of those and mostly retires. And in 1972, he dies of throat cancer, most likely. Mm. He was known to have cancer and probably died of that. Okay. Get the other from- members over time also get caught or shot or okay. sentenced to death. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them even by military trials. So. By the end of the 50s, the whole gang 
is pretty much Caught. decimated, and by the end of the 70s, yeah. they're all gone. They're all dead. Yeah. And that's the end of the front wheel drive gang. Oh, well, I think the moral of the story is playing with a loaded gun can lead you to looking like a Quentin Tarantino film. <laughs>